Ron. Preach the word. You know, uh, <coughs> I rented a movie before I went to the GLC. Okay. And we didn't have time to watch it. Uh, but on the way home, I got to watch it finally, and I learned why the Lord left it to the end of the GLC for me to watch this movie. All right. uh, the, the movie is called Act of Valor. Okay. And that is the title of our lesson today, Acts of Valor, Administering God's Grace. I'm going to spoil the movie for you. It's a movie about a Navy SEAL team, in particular one Navy SEAL, who ended up giving his life to save his team and to save many lives in our country from a terrible terrorist attack. Uh, throughout the lesson, I'm going to be giving you a few of the quotes from the movie that, uh, that really impacted me. Uh, the first quote that impacted me was one of the opening statements. The, 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 movie, the narration of the movie was an actual letter written to a child whose father gave his life to save his team. And so, uh, the beginning of the letter said, The worst thing about growing old is that other men stop seeing you as dangerous. Being dangerous is sacred, a badge of honor. You live your life by a code, an ethos. Every man does. It's your shoreline. It's what guides you home. And trust me, you're always trying to get home. You know, it's an amazing thing that a movie made by men in the world could convey so much about the heart that we need to have as real Christians. You know, our code, our ethos, is the scriptures. And our goal, just like theirs, is to remain dangerous. But dangerous to Satan, amen? See, we're always trying to get home to our heavenly one. I got two scriptures for you today to set the tone for today's lesson. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. All right, come on, bro. 1 Peter chapter 4. I want to talk today about administering God's grace in its various forms with the understanding that each one of the each time you administer God's grace it is an act of valor. 1 Peter 4 and verse 7 The end of all things is near. Therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all Love each other just the way that you feel like loving, right? Oh, man. I don't see that. You didn't see that? That's my version. I'm sorry. <laughs> love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Yeah. Offer, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. And you say, well, I don't really have a gift. Well, if that was true, the Bible would have said, if you have a gift, use it to serve others. But it says each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Check this out. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves... He should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be glory and power forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. So we come to learn that part of our life is administering God's grace in its various forms, which we're going to look at here today. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. Come on, bro. Ephesians chapter 3. In verse 2. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known by revelation. As I have already written briefly, in reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs with Israel, members of one body and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Now, to my knowledge, we don't have any Jewish people in the room at this moment. 
But did you know that at one time, it was a mystery that anyone outside of the Jewish race could have salvation? Now that should fire you on up, because it's it's my knowledge, I don't think there's any Jews in this room. That means you get to be saved. Is that not awesome? Now, true believers are experts in forgiveness. Experts in how to get forgiveness and experts in how to give forgiveness. You know what I'm talking about right there? You know, almost all of Paul's letters begin with the phrase, grace and peace to you. See, that's one of the first things he always wrote because it's one of the most important things for us to convey and to live out in the church. Amen? Amen. It's to make sure that people feel grace and have grace so they can have peace in their lives. I have a little story that I'd like to share with you. Forrest Gump died and showed up at the gates of heaven. He didn't really die. Some of you go, oh my God, Tom Hanks died. No, he's, he's fine. Forrest Gump died and showed up at the gates of heaven. Peter approached him and says, hello, I'm the Apostle Peter, but you can call me Pete. Forrest says, oh, my name's Forrest Gump, but you can call me Forrest Gump. Peter said, well, Forrest Gump, before I let you in, you must answer two questions. Well, okay, Pete. (laughs) Pete says, well, first, how many seconds are there in a year? Uh Forrest thinks for a few minutes and scratches his head and says, well, I do believe there are 12 seconds in a year. Peter says, 12? How the heck did you get that? (laughs) Why, yes, there's 12. There's January 2nd, February 2nd, March 2nd. That is good. That is good. (laughs) Pete says, okay, okay. I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one. For the next question, what is God's name? And for those of us who were at the GLC, we saw many of God's names from the Bible at Chris Broom's lesson, which was awesome. But Forrest had to think about this for a minute. He says, well, while I do believe that his name is Howard. (laughs) Peter says, Howard, how did you get that one? Forrest said, why, from the Lord's Prayer, you know. Our Father who art in heaven, Howard be thy name. (laughs) You know, we're going to be talking about grace today. We're going to be talking about forgiveness today. And I just think some of us can just be a little dense when it comes to this topic. You know what I'm saying? And so we need to look at how to administer grace to one another properly in its various forms. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Our first point today is that you must administer grace to those who hurt the church. You must, you must minister, administer grace to those who hurt the church. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll begin in verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts... No, oh, I'm sorry. That was verse 1. Chapter 1. Chapter 2, verse 3. That's a good scripture, though. <laughs> I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. See, Paul knew when he got to Corinth... He was going to find many things wrong with the church. So he wrote to try and help bring them to repentance before he got there. He says, I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears. Not to grieve you, but to let you know the death of my love for you. Well, what caused him all this anguish? He says in verse 5, if anyone has caused grief... He's not so much grieved me as he's grieved all of you. To some extent, not to put it too severely, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. The reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Must have been a tough challenge you gave. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I've forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I've forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. 
Certainly there was something huge happening in this church when Paul wrote these words. But, I mean, who was he talking about and what was he talking about? Turn your Bibles back to 1 Corinthians, chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 1. Paul says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather be filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I'm not physically present, I am with you in spirit. And I've already passed judgment on the one who did this. Boy, that turns the whole religious world upside down. It says, do not judge. Even though I'm not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. I've already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed. And his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Go to verse 9. I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or greedy, and swindlers, or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave this world. (laughs) But I am now writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, or a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business of it is mine to, what business of it is mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Wow. Come on, bro. That just brought the whole mood of the service down right there, you know? Wow. So, we're actually supposed to put out of the church those who refuse to repent of these things. Yep. This is what we call disfellowshipping someone. But, we learn in 2 Corinthians 2 that it, it's not just to be elitist and put people out. It's to keep the purity of the church, but we must take very seriously when there's church discipline. See, we cannot put somebody out of the church and then just leave them out there. We're supposed to go back and find them. Like that one lost sheep. We're supposed to go get them and reaffirm our love for them and show them mercy and show them grace so that they are not overwhelmed by the world. Certainly these situations come far and few between. It's a very rare thing when we have to get to that kind of, that point. In my time in Portland, there was only two times in four years that we had to have a situation like that. But you know, the reason why I brought this scripture up today is because we have to hold each other accountable in the church. We have to understand what sins hurt the church. And we have to understand the grace that must be given to help people overcome these sins. I mean, most people use this scripture only for sexual immorality. But we come to find it's not just for sexual immorality, but for drunkards, for swindlers, for those who gossip and slander people and refuse to repent. Boy, that adds a whole lot more flavor to the passage, does it not? It also shows us the depth of grace that we must be willing to extend to people. What an amazing passage. See, the heart of Paul was amazing. He said, for me to write this letter brought me to tears. To have to say the things that need to be said. You know, sometimes we have people in church that create huge scenes, make a whole bunch of drama. I know that's none of you. It was the other people. (laughs) But there are people that have repetitive sins that affect the Bible talks, that affect the house churches, that affect entire ministries, entire households. And see, we have got to have the heart of Paul here in this church, amen? Amen. And we've got to be willing to say the hard things and take the hard stands for Jesus. But we also need his heart to hurt when we do so. 
It cannot be from anger. It cannot be from self-righteousness. It must be for the honor of God that we do all these things. And we must administer grace and mercy so that there will be peace in our ministries when it comes to those who hurt the church. We must administer grace to them. Amen? Amen. Secondly, go to John chapter 17. See, we talk about these things because we're a real family. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Sadly, amongst many churches, they don't have problems like that because they're only around each other for a couple hours on Sunday. But secondly, in John 17, we'll begin in verse 20. We must not only administer grace to those who hurt the church, but you personally must administer grace to those who hurt you. Let's look at a prayer of Jesus's in verse 20. John 17, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I in you, may they be in us, so that the world may believe you have sent me. Wow. We begin to understand the importance of our unity in God's church. See, Unity is lost when someone hurts you and you refuse to forgive. Yeah. That's when unity's lost right there. And so, the importance of our unity, though, is that it's the very thing that makes the world know that we are of His. He says, verse 23, verse 22, I have given them the glory you gave me. Is that not an awesome passage right there? Like, we could do a whole thing right there. Yeah. All the glory that was Jesus's, He gave you. Now, why? That they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. What an incredible passage. You know, right before Jesus went to the cross, I think it's safe to say during the toughest time of his life, He prayed for our unity. He was focused on all of us being unified. Before the cross, he was focused on it. On the cross, he was focused about the unity of people forgiving one another because they did not know what they were doing. And after the cross, when he rose from the dead, he focused on it and focused on it until the day he ascended to heaven. I guess it must be important. You see, Jesus, for Jesus, he was all about the unity of everyone that would believe in him and believe in God. Especially when he himself was hurting. He was focused on it. You know, everything in the kingdom is backwards. Mm, Proverbs 19.11 says, A man's wisdom gives him patience. How about that if you're not patient? It is to his glory to do what's opposite of the world to overlook an offense. Wow. Jesus says in Luke 14, 25 through 33, that anyone who does not give up what? Everything. Everything. Cannot be his disciple. And see, if you're going to learn how to administer grace to someone who hurts you, that means you must be willing to give up your standard of forgiveness that you have. <laughs> One of the other quotes in the movie, it was right toward the end where he was writing to the father's child who had never met his father. He said, the code that made your father who he was is the same code that will make you into a man he would admire and respect. Put your pain in a box. Lock it down. We are men made up of boxes. Chambers of loss, of triumph, of hurt, of hope and of love. No one is stronger or more dangerous than a man who can harness his emotion and his past. Use it as fuel. Use it as ammunition. Use it as ink to write the most important letters of your life. I ask you this morning, how do you respond to Jesus' call to forgive of those who hurt you. You know, we went to the GLC last weekend. It was, a, it was an amazing time. We got to see so many people. Uh, you know, for us, we've only been here a month, 
And, and we got to see all the people from Portland again. It was really awesome. But it was, it was for me, personally, it was like a reunion of all those who I had hurt and had hurt me. You know, we went to the speaker's dinner, and wouldn't you know it, a few weeks ago I told a story about us going to do this Bible talk in Palm Springs and how the people talked about us, and we got, all, got them mad, and, you know, Skip challenged me to forgive them, and it took me three, three months. It was embarrassing. But, you know, wouldn't you know, we went to the speaker's dinner, and we sat down right next to that couple. It was, it was awesome. But, you know, in the world, if forgiveness had not happened... The way God makes it happen, it would have been a little awkward, you know what I'm saying? But the sister, it was funny because as we walked up, the sister, she's only about four foot six or four foot seven, she's only about that tall. And she came running up, she's like, give me a hug, I love you. (laughs) And, you know, it was awesome. There was nothing weird. There was nothing awkward. Here, she had talked behind my back to many people. And I eventually finally forgave her the way I should have. And that made it so it was awesome when we saw each other. You know, then, uh, then there was a couple that things got so bad between us and them that they actually had to move from Portland to L.A. That's embarrassing. But we saw them and, and we embraced and they said, man, I wish we would have just obeyed the Bible and forgave the way we should have then. We missed so much time. Because we didn't do it right, right away. I'm so glad that we're resolved now. And of course, when one person gets an attitude, it feeds over to someone else. So when they exited Portland, they got another couple really upset with us. And that went on for a whole year. See, when you're a family, there's issues, right? (laughs) See, if we had just seen each other Sunday mornings, it would have been all good. Hey, what's up? Yeah. No problem. But see, now this couple got really deep in their anger towards us. So much, she said, you know what? We just joined the line of people that have been hurt by the Hardings. Wow, that hurt. (laughs) Minister and people are telling you you're hurting them, you know? Wow. She even got to the point where she was like, you know what? She told Kip, she goes, he needs to be in jail. That's... Woo, you know, you're not, you know you're not doing a very good job as a minister when someone tells you you need to be in jail. You know what I mean right there? You're just like, wow, I guess I'm really blowing it, you know? And then there was another brother who, I remember sitting with him, and the interesting thing is we sat together with him and one of the other people was really angry with me. And the brother's like, so what is wrong? You just seem upset. And he goes, I am upset. And he goes, well, what are you upset about? He goes, I'm upset at him. And he pointed at me. He goes, I want to punch him in the face right now. And, you know, me and that brother got to go, and we went and hung out at Denny's till like 3 in the morning the other night. And it wasn't to get resolved. We got resolved two years ago. But every time we all meet, we got to get together and hang now. And the ones that thought I needed to be in jail, it was, it was hilarious. Because... You see him from across the room and you go, hey, man, I know we're resolved, but I hope Satan did not get in there anymore. <laughs> and she literally came running up the aisle, wrapped her arms around me, kissed me on the cheek, and I was like, oh, my gosh. And it was a holy kiss. There's nothing weird. You know. my, wife, my wife's fine. It's right there. And she said, you know, We miss you guys so much. She said, you know, the saying is true. You don't know what you have until you lose it. And uh, it was just, it was moving. It was moving for me to to have so many of these relationships that had gone so badly at one point be totally, completely restored by the power of grace. Preach it, brother. You know, with all these people, we didn't just tolerate each other at the GLC. We didn't just go hang out with other people because it was too awkward to hang out with each other because there wasn't really the forgiveness we all knew should be there. God actually took our relationships, smashed them down to the ground, 
put them back together the way he wanted them to be so they were better than they were the first time. The first time they had a lot of our own feelings mixed up in it. Now it was totally done the way God wanted it to, and it was better than ever because of it. See, for there to be victory in the kingdom, we have to take things backwards and do not what we feel like doing, but what the Bible tells us to do. I have a few scriptures for you to write down. We're not going to, for time's sake, we're not going to go through all of them. But I want everyone in the church to be armed about how to forgive one another and how to administer the grace of forgiveness when someone hurts you. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, and also verses 29 through 34, give us a very important teaching. First, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Is it not easy to stop making every effort? To stay unified when somebody's hurt you? Isn't it so easy to put the onus on them because they hurt me, so they need to do what's right? Instead of realizing there's not unity, so I need to make every effort? And is it not so easy to get into unwholesome talk about someone when they've hurt you deeply? See, the Bible says, do the opposite of what your sinful nature tells you. Stop talking. And start getting unified. Draw closer to the person, making every effort. 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 18, tells us to be kind. Somebody hurts you? Be kind, right? It says to be kind, compassionate, and the hardest part, to be humble. And then, whoo, baby, this is the challenge of all challenges. Do not repay evil for evil. Matthew 5, verses 21 through 24 is a very powerful one. Because this one we can really get mixed up. It actually teaches us to be reconciled to God before we try and go serve the Lord. To leave our gift at the altar and go get reconciled with our brother. Because to be reconciled with each other is part of being reconciled with God. See, many of us, what we try and do is we try to feel reconciled to God by, do it, by serving the church and doing little things. And we refuse to go talk to the people that we feel hurt by. Many of us also want to talk to the people that hurt us, but it's not to be unified and reconcile. It's to vent and vomit all over them because they hurt us. 1 yeah. Timothy 5, verses 24 through 25 says, the sins of some men trail behind them, and others go before them. Meaning, there's different perspectives on sin, and when we can see it and when we can't. But it brings the understanding that all that sin, whether it goes before someone or trails behind them, is sin. <laughs> it's all the same in God's eyes. But yet we see different sins as worse than another. And so we vary the level of anger we have, or how much forgiveness we will give out or not, based on how, much, how bad we perceive the sin to be. God just says, it's all the same. Just do what my word says. Turn with you, if you will, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. Some of you are saying, who called you and told, told you I was coming today? It's just human nature. Is it in you? Yes. Just say yes. It's in all of us. Matthew 6, verse 14. This is a hard one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's a good place to be in right there. But if you do not forgive men their sins... See, people don't really believe this is in the Bible many times. But if you do not forgive men their sins... Now, I got... Is there any qualifiers here? Is there any, any little... little Fine print? No. No, there's just nothing there, is it? Just a straightforward black and white statement from the Lord here. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. That is crazy. But that is the truth. (laughs) There's one that, the the last one here is one that just, it's always the kicker for me. Go to Romans chapter 6. Y'all learning a little bit? Amen. You knew all this already. Mm-hmm. Just some of you are in our bang it. <laughs> Romans 6. 
in verse 23. Okay, I'm going to need some group participation on this one, all right? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, time for participation. How many of you have ever committed sin? Raise your hand. Okay. A couple of you are liars, but <laughs> amen. So we're all in the same boat, right? That's a good thing. Okay, we're all in the same boat. So, you've sinned, I've sinned, but that sin earned us something. What does the scripture say we earned? Death. death. Wow. You know, death really stinks. But we don't just deserve any death. See, God gave us a picture of the exact death that we all deserve. It's the one we read about Jesus went through. See, we deserved to be falsely accused. We deserved to be spit on and kicked and hit and mocked and beaten all night long. We deserved that spear through our side. You know, anything less of that, you ain't getting what you deserved. And yet we get so angry if somebody wrongs us. Like, we don't deserve it. I don't deserve to be treated like this. Yes, you do. So do I. That doesn't make it right. It didn't make it right what happened to Jesus. But you know, if you've been treated in some bad way, you've got to wrestle with something. God let it happen. See, he's got to go to Satan. Satan's got to go to God and say, hey, I want to attack Alpha. I want to take him out. God says, oh, you go ahead and try it. He said, just don't kill him. That's what he deserves, but I don't give him that. So just don't kill him, and we'll be good. See, there's a spiritual war that happens that God allows you to be attacked because he trusts that you're going to do what his word says in the end. And when it comes, you must administer grace to those who hurt you at the hands of Satan. This morning, learn how to administer grace to those who hurt you. And why is it so important to learn how to administer grace to those who hurt you? Because our third point, because we all must administer grace to those who are lost. Go to Philemon chapter 6. Philemon verse 6. There's no chapters. Paul says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. So that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Wow. You know, John 13, 34, and 35 gives us another great insight into this. Turn there at this time. John 13. Turn there with sharing your faith in mind. Verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. I thought that was an old command, but it's new because there's a caveat he put on it. A new command I give you, love one another, here it comes, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And you know, anytime you read an if, you got to say, well... What if the other thing happens? If you don't love one another, the world will not know that you're a real disciple. And part of love is forgiving when you're hurt. If you cannot forgive when you hurt, you cannot give forgiveness to others through God's word. See, there's, a, there's an interesting paradox in the world. You can only help someone attain a, the level of grace that you yourself Give to others. You've got to really work on forgiveness this morning, amen? Amen. You see, it's a funny thing. You cannot administer grace to people that you don't talk to. You can't administer the grace to those you don't reach out to. You cannot give grace to those you are unwilling to sacrifice for before you meet them. You know, in 2006... Tracy and I moved twice. We moved first to Portland, Oregon, to rainy, dumpy, cold, dreary, 
Need vitamin D taken city. To save ourselves spiritually. How about that? But then we got our vision for the kingdom of God back again. And we moved a second time nine weeks later to start a church in, in Los Angeles, California. See, we literally sacrificed everything in our lives. I had a job making $130,000 a year. That's not worth my salvation. Gave it up. I took my retirement, cashed it all in, used the money to start the City of Angels Church. See, I sacrificed everything to get grace, but it's a funny thing. When you are willing to sacrifice everything to get grace yourself, you know what the natural response is? You sacrifice everything to give it to people as well. See, Jesus sacrificed everything to save those who were lost. Every time you forgive someone, every time you help someone get strong, you build unity by administering grace. And it's a great proportion. The more you sacrifice, the more people get saved because of it. And today, I need every disciple in our church to commit themselves to administering grace to those who are lost. There are 8 million lost people in this city. You can find one. You know, uh, the more you give up, the more people you'll reach. There was, a, there was an incredible part of the movie, movie. You know, the father in this movie that the movie is about gave up his life, not just to save his company, but to keep 16 suicide bombers from getting into underground tunnels to make their way into the 16 largest cities of the United States with new suicide vests that would annihilate at least half of each of those cities. It would have been, it would have made 9-11 look like a cakewalk. And what the man's friend wrote in the letter, he said, there is no room for sympathy. If you are not willing to give up everything, you've already lost. Mm. Today, let's learn to give up everything so that we can administer grace to a lost world. Amen? Amen. But you know, all that will never happen if you don't get our fourth point on straight. You must administer grace to yourself. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Y'all with me? You know, Timothy was young when he went into the ministry. I can't relate. I went into the ministry as an older man. But yet there is so much to learn from him. Because he started off strong, but then he gave in a lot and got filled with tons of guilt. Verse Timothy 1, verse 12. Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength. He's he's trying to urge Timothy to get strength. That he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. See, See, Timothy had gotten to the point where he didn't feel worthy to be in the ministry anymore. Because he had given in so much. He says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man... I was shown mercy. See, Paul's trying to appeal to him. He says, Timothy, you're not that bad, okay? I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, and I got mercy. You can repent of what's going on in your life. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. And if Timothy accepted it, I think we should probably do it as well. Amen. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Why did Paul read these words to Timothy and write them? 
Because Timothy was too hard on himself. Timothy did not accept the grace of God and beat himself down until he got into more sin because he would not take God's grace. The biggest reason we don't administer grace to others is because we don't administer it to ourselves. I have a newsflash for all of you. You're not Jesus. You're going to sin. So it's time for some of you to step up and start accepting a lot more grace from God. The minute you accept the grace, you won't want to get back into the sin. So for those of you who are baptized disciples of Jesus this morning, how many sins were you forgiven of on the day of that baptism? That day that you went under the water and your faith put you in contact with Jesus' blood and it wiped all that away? That's a lot of sin. It's a dirty tub when you got out. <laughs> See, the grace of God was poured out on you abundantly, was it not? You were so in touch with how much sin it was. That's why you were so happy. You know, I think this area of administering grace to ourselves is one of the biggest challenges for our older Christians. See, the longer we're disciples, especially if you read Ecclesiastes, the more in touch you are with how wicked your insides are. The sins of the heart. Oh, we stop cussing and we start smoking and committing sexual immorality, but we get those attitudes. We get those criticalnesses. Offa doesn't get those, but the rest of us do. <laughs> Noel gets them every once in a while, but then he comes up and cries and we all get in touch with ours and repent too. But see, the more we get in touch with how much sin is in our hearts, the more we are tempted to stop forgiving ourselves or allowing God to forgive us. You know, they were getting ready to go out on the deployment in the movie. He said, you think about how you could have been a better son, a better dad. That bedtime story you should have read to your kids. You don't expect your family to understand what you're doing. You just hope they'll accept it. You know, we went to the conference, and there was a section for the church leaders about marriage and family. And they had like five couples get up in a row and talk about how a great family is supposed to run. How to have a great marriage and how to have a great family. And at the end of that, I was like a mess. I was so convicted about... I mean, I was like, I thought we were doing pretty good, you know? We got our weekly times, we talk, we're doing better, and then we had the lesson, I was like, I just need to go home and get my life right. <laughs> like, wow, there's so much more I need to do. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, those things will happen. But, you know, I was such a mess, I was so convicted after the lesson, I had to preach two hours later... And I went over to Jack, and I was like, dude, uh, Jack goes, if there had been like five minutes more, my head was going to explode. <laughs> I was like, I know what you mean. I was like, i got to preach in two hours. How the heck am I going to preach when I'm such a mess? But then I had to go back, and I had to have some time with God. And I had to pray, and I had to get my heart right again. That all those sins that were exposed don't make me any more or less prepared to be able to preach and minister. Because that is how powerful the grace of God is in our lives. You know, uh, there was another quote in the movie. He said, once we step off on campaign, he's giving them a charge right before they go out. Once we step off on campaign, everything back home needs to be in balance. We're not going to be any good to each other or ourselves if we get over there and something's out of whack. If things aren't right with the family or finances or something is off, it's going to put us all out of balance. We need to have that tight before we launch. If someone's got an issue, bring it up. Chief can take care of it, or if I can take care of it, we got your back. Let's make sure we lock that down before we launch. All of our focus is on the mission. To us and those like us, very few. Wow. That was written by the world. How much more for us as disciples? See, you can only give as much grace as you're willing to accept. 
And today, you've got to be fired up about how God lavishes grace on you day after day. And pours His grace and peace into your life. I love the end of the movie. The, the end of the movie is powerful. The charge that he writ, wrote to the, the, the kids, to the kid from the father. The father asked him, if I die, share this poem with my son. Live your life that the fear of death can never enter your heart. Love your life. Perfect your life. Beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and of service to your people. When your time comes to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with the fear of death, so that when their time comes, they weep and pray for a little more time so they can live their lives over in a different way. In fact, sing your song of death like one coming home. In order to win this world in our generation for Christ, we must commit ourselves to countless acts of valor. We must administer grace to those who hurt the church. You must administer grace to those who hurt you. And we must all take part in administering grace to a lost world. And you cannot forget to administer grace to yourself. Have a great afternoon. I love you all very much.